welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute, a daily podcast in which we dig in deep to analyze the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. I'm Andy Nelson from thenextreel.com. We are looking at Jon Favreau's 2008 film, Iron Man, the film that kicked off this whole crazy thing that has been running for 10 years now. Joining me again today is Matthew Westfox from the Superhero Ethics Podcast. Hey, Matthew. Hey, how are we doing? I've been uh, really enjoying these. Looking forward to doing one more. Yes, indeed. Uh, we are, of course, talking about Minute 47 of Iron Man. Minute 47 starts with Obadiah cleaning up Tony's mess, and <laughs> it ends with Obadiah dropping, I guess you could call it a comic book Easter egg on us. It's a little hint that I love that he throws in there at the end of this minute. Mm. But before we get to the end, uh, let's talk about the beginning. This is the end of this press conference. Tony has just kind of dropped this bombshell that he wants to change direction of the company, no longer selling weapons. We get Obadiah jumping up quickly to interrupt him. And I love his line that is kind of buried, but it's a great line. He says, OK, I think we're going to be selling a lot of newspapers. <laughs> That's a man who understands business and the way things work. Yeah, I've actually done some uh, press press relations work and in, um, in, in, a, in a former career of mine where I did nonprofit work um, and I did a lot of media relations. And, and, and one of the things they always teach you is be on the press's good side, especially if you think they're going to write bad news about you. <laughs> right. And, and to me, that's what that says. He has that instinct of I, I need to keep them on my side. And, and also, as we were saying about the uh, uh, one of the minutes, uh, I think a couple minutes ago, he needs to keep control. He wants to still be in control of things. And something has just happened that is wildly outside of anything he planned. That is taking all the control from him. And he's trying to reassert control and saying, no, 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 guys, they, they don't. Let, let, we're selling papers. This is great. We'll, we'll figure it out. I mean, he even says it right there after that when he when Tony kind of walks away from the podium. You have Obadiah who's just like, you know, I think what's what we should take away from this is Tony's yeah. back. You know, he just, you know, he's like you're redirecting them. He's doing his best to kind of change that focus. And he's got that great Jeff Bridges smile and that delivery that is just, you know, you know, this is what you need to be paying attention to. Right, you know, it's like that's where he's like that that salesman from Sea Biscuit yeah. type of uh, <laughs> type of uh, <laughs> thing that he's doing right there. It works great, and it's just another of those elements that really speaks to the way that Obadiah is kind of really doing everything he can to secretly be pulling the strings of this company to make sure that it's running the way that he wants it to, which for him is the way that makes it the most profitable. We get the end of this press conference. Uh, we get that great moment. It's interesting watching Tony over the course of this because he really starts in this emotional place where he's talking about his father. And as it builds, you can see him making more and more of a commitment to this decision that he's making. And he stands up and he gets behind the podium and he talks about the this new direction for the company. And I mean, he says one that I'm comfortable with and is consistent with the highest good for this country as well. It really is like this grand define redefining that he's picturing here. And he gets so worked up and the way and I don't I can't tell if he's just worked up from the moment and the fact that it's riled him up along with everybody in the room that makes him storm off. Or is it Obadiah kind of kind of wanting to step in and, and kind of stop him from saying too many things that he shouldn't be saying. But I find it really interesting the way that he plays it because he hits this kind of pitch point with his delivery where he he finishes what he's saying, but while he's walking away, like he's he's gotten himself so emotionally worked up that he actually just walks out of this press conference that he's called. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting question. I, I definitely think that's a little of both. I'm going to be a bit persnickety here and just point out a continuity error, which is uh, part of what happens here is Obadiah wraps his, his hand and arm around Tony's injured arm and is visibly patting him on a shoulder that is injured, um, which probably right. would not feel very good to Tony. <laughs> but but putting, again, that minor quibble aside, I, I think you're right. I think the, the look on on Tony's face is really telling. And then it get, we were talking last uh, yesterday about the, the different looks that everyone's giving. A lot of where I understand what is happening with Tony is the look on, on Brody's face, where Brody kind of looks down and looks a little troubled. Brody. I think it's an interesting moment where uh, you're not sure is Brody troubled there about because he thinks Tony is going off the deep end? Is he troubled because Tony is raising questions he doesn't want to answer? Or as Brody is, is one of the people who's always wanted Tony to grow up, 
is he troubled because he sees Obadiah jumping in and trying to kind of, you know, put the reins on Tony growing up? He's one of the characters I've always wished we had more of, and I wish we had a lot more. Like, I'd love a roadie backstory movie. Yeah. And and that look especially is one where I, I don't honestly know what he's thinking in that moment. I think there's a lot of different possibilities, and I, I really like it for that reason. It is really interesting. And, and, and Rhodey's an interesting character, especially with his backstory, because he wasn't necessarily this military man that they've made him in the mm. films. He was a, uh, I think he was a pilot, if I recall, for Tony in the comics and over the course of it became his buddy. And then when Tony descends into alcoholism, he's the one who kind of helps him out and and takes on the mantle of Iron Mm. Man for quite a number of years while Tony is lost in the streets and drunk and homeless and everything. Really interesting way that that plays out. It's interesting that they do make him in the film here so directly tied to the military and very much the liaison between the Air Force and and Stark and the one who kind of helps define that relationship and, and what needs to be happening within it. So it's it's an interesting character. And I, I do feel like, you know, I'll, we'll talk about this more in a, uh, a week or so when we bring Rhodey back and talk a little bit more about kind of the relationship between these two guys. But it's interesting to see how this friendship, what this look is signaling. Is there going to be a possible change in their friendship or their working relationship? What's actually going to happen? Right. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't think it's coincidental that up to this point, we've had three major people in Tony's life all of whom obviously have different opinions on where they want Tony's life to be and what they think of what it is right now. And so getting to see all three of them, Obadiah, Pepper, and Rhodey, each react, I think is, it's like three different mirrors being held up to Tony to show us three different perspectives on him, which I really like. It's interesting. I I mentioned yesterday that Pepper actually has a a brief exchange with Tony as he's walking out that we don't get in the film. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we needed it, but I do like the way that it plays out. The script says, Tony steps down exhilarated. He works his way through the swarming reporters, approaching Rhodey and Pepper, who have stunned looks on their faces. And then Pepper says, you mean that? Or is this some clever stock maneuver? And then Tony just says, wait and see. And that's the end of the scene. It's a brief exchange, but... You know, I like the way that Pepper kicks that off because even she and, and you you said it yesterday how it, it, there's almost this tiny hint of a smile. It's almost like this is the direction she's wanting to see Tony go. And I like that she's in this line. She's kind of guarding herself. You can see that sense that she's hoping for it, but she's still guarded. She says, you mean that or is this some clever stock maneuver? And I like the way that that line plays out. Again, I don't think we need it, but I, I feel like it hits perfectly for exactly what you saw in her look yesterday. Yeah. And it's funny because, and I, uh, I had not read the script, so I'm loving all the stuff you're bringing in from it. You were talking a few minutes ago about how it's not really clear what Tony is feeling as he's walking off the stage. And honestly, he looks, as I see it, a little bit, not dejected, but a little frustrated. And so the idea that he walks off the stage exhilarated, that feels yeah. like a very different stage direction than what actually winds up happening. Yeah, right. I thought that too, because I don't see him exhilarated either. I see him like it, almost this like this angry panic sort of thing as he's as he's leaving here. You know, mm-hmm. this is uh, the end of this big press conference, though. But it's not the end of the exchange that Tony is going to be having with Obadiah. We have Obadiah closing his remarks as we dissolve from this to a wonderful establishing shot of Stark International Industries. Which, as I mentioned yesterday, is the uh, Massimo building. Right. But if you look at this shot, this is a, a, a I mean, it's really like this mega complex. And there's, as I was looking at this and looking at, at Google Maps to try comparing the two, it's not just Massimo. Massimo is like the main building, the one at the very front with the kind of the round entrance area. Uh-huh. They also have all of these buildings around this whole complex and you can tell because most of them have stark written on the tops of them which i think is really (laughs) funny i'm not sure who is going to actually put their their name on the tops of each of their buildings but apparently tony stark is going to be doing that and it made me laugh when i i saw that and i was like is that just something that the filmmakers are doing to just kind of help define better which ones actually are part of stark industries or is that something that just fits with tony's ego 
And I think it's a little of both. Well, I, I, I think you're right. Although what I would even say is I don't know if it's Tony's ego or the Stark family ego because sure, granted, yeah. and we only, we only learned about him a lot later, but from what everything I know about Howard Stark, I think he would be just as likely to put his name on all those buildings. Yeah, no, that's very true. For me, one of the things that I love in this establishing shot, um, both of the ship and, and then what we see immediately afterwards, is that Obadiah rides in on a Segway. And I just find that such a charming touch. A, because, I, I mean, I've ridden on a Segway once. I think they're great, but but they're always thought of, I think, as a little bit ridiculous. But to me, it, it sets up the potential of him becoming Ironmonger a little bit because it's, it's just this very subtle way of saying, here's a man who will use technology for every possible thing he can. You know, and, and again, maybe this is me sort of seeing a lot in a teeny little thing, but you asked me to talk for an hour about just one or two minutes. This is what's going to happen. Right. But I just, I just love that. I'm wondering if you were struck by that as well, because I just thought that was such an interesting moment of being like, yeah, this is the kind of man who wants, who, who would climb into the Ironmonger suit, who just wants to have technology do every possible thing it can for him. Yeah, I, I think that's very true. And reading about people's reactions of seeing Jeff Bridges on that segue as we see him trying to find Tony, he's riding around the property trying to figure out where Tony went. It clearly is a shot and a moment that people love because everybody on the internet is just like Jeff Bridges owns that segue. Like he is just, <laughs> he is the boss and he looks tough and he looks like he knows what he's doing when he's riding in on that Segway, like he he just has the lean and, and just he hops off. He's got his cigar in his mouth. It just works so perfectly. And I think it's a great additional moment that helps define who this character is. Uh -huh. It's very funny. It's very funny. This it looks like it's a it's an I2, a Segway I2 SE. These run about six thousand dollars. From what I was reading online, people complained quite a bit about, I, I don't know if it's a bad kickstand or a lack of a kickstand on these, but people were always complaining about this particular model tipping over. People were wondering if in the world of Iron Man, if they would actually have a Segway with an awesome kickstand, which was very funny. <laughs> and then they all laughed when they go, oh no, you know, Happy goes up and, and, and takes it right away. So obviously you don't have to worry about it falling over. So I thought that was a very funny thing for people who've obviously dealt with these to to point out definitely definitely i was trying to compare we have several establishing shots here we got that fantastic overhead granted it's it's very digitally altered and then we come to the shot where as you said we have stain riding in on his segue i was trying to figure out for the longest time where in the overhead shot this particular scene is and i finally pinpointed it it just it took me forever the giveaway, I think, is this giant glass wall that is the front of this building uh -huh. and and the fact that in the distance you have those two buildings with the curved roofs. Now, the thing that was throwing me is behind those, you have a bunch of buildings that are, it's like a bunch of smokestacks is what it looks like. In the overhead shot, this particular spot that we're looking at is over on the far right side of the property in the building that's, I guess you could say it's closest to the freeway that's running next to it. And those little that little uh, area is right there. And if you look re really carefully, you can see where the helicopter is, and you can you can't see stain riding in on the on the Segway, but you can see where the area is. And and if you look back behind it, you can see where the two buildings with the curved roofs are. The problem is that all of the smokestacks and everything, like none of it really lines up perfectly. Like it doesn't work as a as a as right. a background because those buildings are way too far off to the side to actually be behind those buildings but whatever it's it's uh, you know a little a little <laughs> filmmaking fudgery to make yeah. for a much, much more interesting backdrop and you know i guess i'll forgive them for that because if it wasn't for me scrutinizing this minute so in such detail i never would have noticed <laughs> well especially because i think um and, and i think this is something i was very well aware of as i was thinking about this movie this movie is, it, it really, like, as we, we talked about, it kind of gives birth to the MCU. And and not that the MCU is fully responsible for this, but the MCU, I think, is a big part of creating the culture that we now have of doing not just kind of minute-by-minute -minute analysis, but, but very intense analysis for Easter eggs and for when, when the movies have this much continuity, we want everything to hold together. And I don't think we talked about movies in that, like, I don't, I think when most people were making movies in the 2000s, I don't think they were often thinking, okay, 
we have to make sure that this building perfectly matches what we set up in the establishing shot because they didn't think that many people were going to be the huge nerds that we are today of, of analyzing right. it. And, and so I think it's kind of funny because I think we're sort of analyzing Iron Man with a lens that they weren't thinking about at the time but that we're thinking about now in large part because of Iron Man. So I, I just think there's kind of an amusing irony there. It will be interesting to see. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, technology is constantly changing. You know, filmmakers who made films uh, like Star Wars or, or films before it or in the 80s certainly weren't expecting this type of scrutiny with their films. It'll be interesting to see in the coming decades as more and more Movies by Minutes podcasts end up out there and people really scrutinizing every every detail of these films if that ends up shifting the way that filmmakers start thinking about what they have to do when they're putting their stuff together because it's like oh people are analyzing these frame by frame here you know Mm -hmm. we shall see oh so we we uh, follow stain as he enters this building we go from the exterior of the uh, location to the interior of the set we are now in and finally seeing the big arc reactor this is the technology that we know as we've seen uh, tony has in his chest he's built a mini version of this and it's keeping him alive and finally now we see the big one and it is a really big interesting piece of set propage obviously you know it's actually there but they from what i saw from set photos it's the the tube portion of the arc reactor is just kind of a solid with all the marks on it so they could come in and digitally kind of create all the cool lights and everything really interesting element here and it allows for an interesting conversation for us to have this was something that was developed by Tony's father, and it was inspired by the, and I don't know if I'm going to say this right, but the Tokamak, which is a real-world fusion device that is still in development. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, Ryan Minerding, who is the production designer, designed it to include the concave center shape that distinguished the Tokamak. Uh, I don't know. I, I think it's a really interesting element that we have here that obviously is going to be kind of a a crucial part of the story here. Yeah, and it it sets up so much because uh, we've talked a lot about his relationship with his father in in, in some of the past minutes, and this will will go on to be such a vital part of his trying to to, to catch the memory of his father in the second Iron Man movie, and it's all about this arc reactor. It's interesting, and I I don't know... I, I know that Favreau had the idea of wanting to do the MCU and not just him, but that they weren't sure if they could pull it off. I wonder with things like this, if he was intentionally thinking, okay, let's bring in the arc reactor so we could now make, we can use that for the next movie. Or if it was just the, they, they put all these things in to make a great movie and then later we're able to say, oh, well, we put in the arc reactor, let's use that for the second movie. I'd be really curious someday to really hear Favreau talk about how much he really was intentionally laying the ground for everything else that would come in this first movie. Yeah, I think that there was some of that. I think that the team behind this was obviously hoping to have some of that and to be able to kind of transition into something that was a little grander on a, on a scale that really tied all this together. Certainly, Avi Arid and Kevin Feige were, were pushing for all of that. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that they introduced little bits here and there but t- probably to the extent that they would probably try doing that in the Spider-Man films, in any other film that was released, in the hopes that at least they'd get a sequel out of it, that they could you know, have those mentions. And I'm sure that they were hoping for this much, much larger world to all of a sudden pop like it did. But I don't think that they necessarily were able to count on it. Mm-hmm. And so I think I think that they were threading as many things as they could through it. And it, I just think that they were really lucky that it all ended up working. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, it is amazing when you think about it that so often for things like this to have continuity, they need to fudge details. They need to sort of retroactively say, oh, no, we meant this. And, and the fact that all this holds together is just, I think, so, so well done. Yep, yep. Going back to the uh, the tokamak, which I had mentioned, mm-hmm. that is actually a device that I think that is something that the Russians had actually come up with. Oh, interesting. It uses a powerful magnetic field to confine a hot plasma in the shape of a torus. 
not a Taurus meaning like a bull, but a Taurus, T-O-R-U-S, which looks like a donut, basically, which is that shape that we see here with this arc reactor that they designed. I don't really know anything about the tokamaks, but I guess it is something that Soviet scientists started working with in the 50s. And it's something that they have been playing around with since. Not just the Soviets, but everybody has kind of been playing around with these. And the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor is the largest tokamak in the world, began construction actually in 2013, so after this film, and they're hoping to have it ready by 2035. So that's quite a length of time it takes to actually build one of these things. Which again makes him constructing one in like a week or two in the cave. A little eyebrow raising, but but he is a genius, so I guess he can do anything. But this one that they're working on, it's supposed to be a demonstration that a practical fusion reactor is possible, and it should produce 500 megawatts of power. I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see in 2035 what actually happens with this with this crazy device. That'll, that'll be interesting to see. It definitely will. But I'll be curious if when that comes online, if people refer to it as an arc reactor. Wouldn't that be great? Just needs to have some repulsor technology. Exactly. That would make it all the better. This is just a, a side note, but something that I forgot to mention before we actually go in here. This is a Marvel film. It is a comic book movie. But it strikes me as uh, a little surprising that in a film like this, we not only have Obadiah Stane puffing on a, a cigar, but we have Happy Hogan puffing on a cigarette. And in a movie like this, I'm like, oh, interesting to see two characters in a scene together, both smoking and puffing their smoke away. Yeah. Kind of the thing that you almost don't expect to see anymore because they've come down on smoking so much in film. Yeah, and I think that's true. And I think part of that is... I think we talked about this on the first minute that I was on last week that, you know, that this is them trying to say, yes, this is Marvel, but not all superhero movies have to be kids movies, right. you know, and really trying to, to, to raise the bar there. I also think if you made this movie in 2018, Obadiah might smoke the cigar because he's the bad guy. I don't think Happy smokes a cigarette. Yeah, I was wondering if that was something that Favreau threw in. I, I don't know if he smokes or not, but I know he's a, a cigar fan. I mean, I, I don't know if he smokes cigarettes, but I know he's a cigar fan. Mm. So I wonder if he just threw that in as as kind of a, I don't know. I don't know why, but there it is. And so it just, it strikes me as one of those things. I'm like, oh, look at that. Both characters are smoking. Who'd have thunk it? Yeah, I can see that. It's kind of a neat, neat, neat little moment. This is a, uh, it's a nice little conversation that we start here in this minute between Obadiah and Tony about the uh, post press conference and kind of the reactions and the whole idea about, you know, did I just paint a target on the back of my head? Your head? What about my head? And then, Going from that straight to the stocks, you know, what do you think the over under the stock drop is going to be? I think that the, it's an interesting balance that these two guys have with Obadiah coming in. And again, I think the way that he plays it is obviously as a man who's dealing with the business side of this and, and looking at this whole thing from the business side. But he's very direct and, and the way that he's approaching Tony and everything that Tony just did. I think that it's it plays really nicely. And obviously, Tony understands what he just did. And I, I like the way that this scene plays out and the way that these two are dealing with kind of the repercussions here. And what really struck me is that they're really talking about totally different axes because what basically Tony Stark is saying is we are making weapons, but they're going to the wrong people and we don't have any accountability and we're not thinking enough about that. And you would think that Obadiah would respond in those same terms and say, no, we're, you know, the weapons are going to the U.S. government and they're helping to fight the, the terrorists and we can't control all of it, but we're doing our best. Instead, he's just very cynical. He doesn't in any way attempt to sort of ideologically debate this with Tony or even say, Tony, your concerns have some legitimacy or Tony, here's why your concerns are not legitimacy. He just says, why even think about that? And I thought that was really interesting because, like you said, it, it shows that he's not – Tony has an ideological perspective and Obadiah doesn't have a different ideological perspective. He just cares about business. Yeah. He doesn't care about – you know, it's, it's being amoral instead of immoral. Right, right. Which I, I, I think is a nice way of – because it's asymmetrical. It's not an exact debate with Tony in a way I really like. Well, and, and I mean, he says, uh, which I think defines this really well. I mean, we're a weapons manufacturer. It's like, what do you expect us to do? That's yeah. what this business is. I think that's a really interesting point that he makes here. Because, I mean, what Tony is suggesting essentially is, let's shut the company down. We can't manufacture weapons anymore. 
it's an interesting way for somebody who's running a weapons manufacturing company to take a position on. And I, I mean, I think to that end, Obadiah really is kind of right. It's like you don't walk in as the head figure of a weapons company and say, oh, we're not going to do this anymore because weapons are bad. It's like, what are you what are you doing? <laughs> it's it's that's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, to me, I, I would disagree there. I think that's exactly what uh, a, a corporation like that should be doing. And um, if you want to hear more debates like that, check out Superhero Ethics, po- uh, the podcast. <laughs> that's exactly the kind of stuff we discuss. But here's again where I like I, I throw that off as a joke, but I, I, I've talked about my podcast on other minutes and I'll talk about it at the end. But uh, I'll just say as an aside, what started my going on the on on that path of wanting to do a podcast about superhero ethics was the Civil War movie because of the fact that people I knew could walk out of that movie and some were on Team Tony and some were on Team Cap. I love a movie where the movie sets up a question and different people can watch the movie and have different responses. And and I love that 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 right here that that you and I and I'm sure many other people can watch this debate between Tony and Obadiah. And even though we know that Tony's the good guy and we later know that Obadiah is the bad guy, it's not clear which one of them is right. You know, that in this discussion, both of them clearly think they are in the right. And you can understand both sides of their argument and and different people can have different perspectives. And I think that's especially in comic book movies where it's so easy to say, here's clearly the good guy, here's clearly the bad guy. That that's, I think, a very powerful choice to have have moments where the moral lines are a lot grayer than you might think. Yeah. And it's nice here. And obviously it works for our protagonist's character arc because he is a bad guy who has his eyes opened and sees that the things that he's doing are affecting people and and are leading to people's deaths. And he realizes how bad that is and wants to change. Mm -hmm. And you have Stain, the antagonist, who is looking at it purely from the business perspective. I mean, he didn't have this experience that Tony did, and he is seeing it from the business perspective. And he says, this is what we do. We're a weapons manufacturer. And and this is that line that he says, we're ironmongers. It's the only time we hear it in the film. Yeah. And it's a great little nod to the character that we will see come later. But he is defined by his role. And because of that, he's not able to look past it and becomes it and that leads i guess you could say to his downfall yeah it's funny first of all because i i had i didn't remember him saying the words we are the iron mom uh, we are the iron mongers and so i i learned in reading more about this movie like you know five six years ago that his character is referred to as iron monger because that's what it is in the comics and i thought oh that's interesting because I, I get if that's what's in the comics if that's what's here but they never actually say that anywhere and so to actually hear him say it I was like, oh that's that's nice Again, I think this establishes something that the Marvel movies do really well is, and again, how much the MCU is burst in this movie. I think in a lot of comic books and in comic book movies sometimes, you know, real people don't talk that way. No one says, I'm the penguin, <laughs> I'm the joker. I'm, I'm that, That's something we think of as very kind of great but eye rolly in comics. I like that in most of the Marvel movies they don't do right. that. Like other people might sort of give someone a nickname and we know it from the comics – but they never just sort of proclaim, I am Ironmonger, I am the Mandarin, or I guess they do in that, but it's a whole other story. And I like I think Doc Ock never quite literally calls himself that in the in the second yeah. movie. Certainly um not the um no, no, Doc Ock, I'm sorry, that's a Spider Man thing. But but you know what I mean? Like the, they don't announce themselves in the MCU movies as the, the villains they are. And and so I like that this kind of establishes that pattern of he uses the words Ironmonger, but he never quite says, This is what I am. Yeah, right. No, it's 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 nicely done, and it is something that they kind of continue. And even as we get into some of the later films, I like how quite often they refer to each other by their first names, you know? And I think that's actually a really interesting thing that, I don't know, I guess it struck me funny, but I guess it made sense. And I, I you know, it, it made me want to go back to the comics and do people walk around calling Captain America Steve all the time, or do they call black widow natasha you know they do they call them by their first names or do they just you know it's not like they're running around hey black widow catch you know or whatever you know it's yeah and and so but in your head like in the world of comic books that seems like probably what they're doing but it just it it grounded a little bit more when you don't have to feel like everybody is running around with this moniker that they're making everybody use yeah so 
Production design wise, we've got some Taylor Wharton storage tanks behind these guys. There's some XL4 and XL160 storage tanks that store liquid nitrogen. And the other direction, and I thought this was interesting, we have a sign for a tank that has palladium hexafluoride. Now, we obviously have talked about palladium on the show before because that is the material that Tony was extracting from the missiles with Yinsen to make that nice. ring that was going to be kind of the catalyst for the mini arc reactor that he built for his chest. Palladium hexafluoride isn't something that does exist, but reading about it online, there are theoretical studies that do predict that it would be stable, which, you know, I don't know enough about <laughs> what the scientists are doing to try to figure this sort of thing out. But according to them, this is what it says. It says, a theoretical study predicts the stability of palladium hexafluoride, formerly a D4 ion with two unpaired electrons, as well as its vibrational spectra and a spin density distribution with a peculiar shape. Interesting. There you go. There you go. I, I am not a scientist by any stretch of the imagination. So, like, another one of my favorite shows is Star Trek. It's when we talk about sometimes on my own podcast. And I admit I have friends who love to get all into the debates about warp cores and my eyes just glaze over at those things. Yeah, and, and this is one of those things. I, I don't I don't know what any of that means, but yeah. it sounds interesting. And I like that the filmmakers put that in there. You know, it's I think that it's an interesting addition to just throw in because it feels like they actually thought about it and some of these things that would make sense for Tony to have here. Yeah, I mean it's an incredible attention to detail, you know, and it's a really yeah. incredible attention to the idea that they wanted I, I keep harping on this but I, I just I keep finding ways in this where it show that they didn't want to make a movie they wanted to make a world you know and they really want yeah. they, they put this movie in a larger world I, on some level it just makes you think how glad I am this all all worked because you imagine that uh, especially given you know the next movie Iron Man 2 came but then the Hulk which I think is a much better movie than most people do but the point is, it was not very successful. And I think there was a, a big push to just not do the MCU after the, the Hulk movie didn't work out. And you just think, what a tragedy that would have been if they had done so much to seed this world and yet never gotten to play with it. Yeah, right. That would have been a, a tragedy. We would have just, uh, we were joking on one of the other shows that we would have, you know, how many Iron Man reboots would we have had by now as they were trying to get it right, you know, just like mm -hmm. the Fantastic Four films. Yeah, <laughs> the less talked uh, about those, the better. Right. Well, I don't have anything else. What about you? You feeling good with this one? No, I think, yeah, we, we covered pretty much everything I wanted to say. All right. Well, Matthew, uh, do you want to remind everybody where they can find you once again? Sure, yeah. I probably talked about it a little too much, but uh, already my, my podcast is called Superhero Ethics. It's a podcast about ethical discussions from the superhero world, the science fiction, fantasy world. You can find us under Superhero Ethics, superhero one word, ethics the second word on iTunes, on Stitcher, on most of the places where you can find podcasts. You can also find us at our website, www.superheroethics.com. Um, we're also on both Facebook and Twitter, uh, and we love to talk to fans there. And so if you've got thoughts you wanted to, to share about uh, what I had to say here, but especially about some more other episodes or anything about ethical questions involving superheroes or science fiction or fantasy, definitely send us a message there on the Superhero Ethics, one word, Facebook and Twitter, or you can email us at superheroethics at gmail.com. This has really been a lot of fun. I've been enjoying this the last couple of days, and I think we've got one more together, and I look forward to it. One more minute. We'll be chatting tomorrow. Looking forward to it. Well, everybody, that is it for today's show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe to the show for free at marvelmovieminute.com. Join us over in our Discord chat room. And, of course, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Next Reel. And if you like what we do and you want to support us and get some cool stuff, why don't you become a patron over at patreon.com slash The Next Reel. Until next time, true believers. True believers.